Creating worlds and settings in the ImagCard role-playing game is actually incredibly easy, and at any time you can create a whole new world or add to one by creating what we call world things. In order to do this, you draw five of any types of cards. So we have the world, the things, and the actions cards. So let's just say we'll have two world, uh, one things, and two actions. So what we drew here was some kind of wall or something, a flag, uh, some scissors, a frowny face, and somebody eating. Um, now, of course, these are all up to personal interpretations. You can decide they mean whatever you want. Uh, but let's just say that instead of adding to a world, we're creating a whole new one. So what you do then is you actually draw five cards per player. So let's just say that we're playing with three players. So let's grab another ten. And it's completely random. It doesn't really matter uh, what sets you draw from when you're creating world things. Now that we've drawn the appropriate number of cards, we'll just get the excess ones out of the way. And we also now have a jail cell, a sundial, a flashlight, some kind of desert landscape, um, something being smashed with a hammer, uh, somebody defending with a shield, uh, somebody doing something with their ear, maybe it's a phone, maybe they're just listening, um, a wig on a wig stand, uh, a DNA strand, and somebody kicking. So what we do now is each player will go around the table and select up to three of these to come up with a fact about the world. Now these have to be wide-ranging facts. Basically it's something that affects the entire world. So let's just start with something simple. Let's say we take the sundial and the flashlight and we'll say that there is, you know, actually why not? Let's also add this person listening. And we'll say that there is an extreme shortage of light because days are incredibly short and therefore people have incredibly good hearing. Bing. So we've just created a very complex, very good world thing that includes a lot of details about the world that we can build on later as we play. So we'll just set those aside and now we have our first world thing. Uh, next let's grab these two here. And let's say that because of the lack of light, the world has been largely reduced to a desert with very few oases of, of actual growable food. Um, not so much water oases as they are food oases, and therefore food is at an extreme shortage. Bing. So now we can see how world things can build off other world things that we came up with previously. Uh, next, let's take this defending guy, uh, this wall thing, and this flag, and let's say that because of the lack of resources, um, different nation states have really divided up very, very well. They defend their borders to defend their food. Um, of course, this would be a nation state. The flag is sort of a symbol of, of a nation. And they've set up walls and, and strong borders to defend themselves. Bing. So you have this very sort of totalitarian, multiple totalitarian regimes across the world controlling the food supply. Let's go on ahead and grab these two next and say that for this uh, there's been a, a need that's grown for people to break through these barriers um, largely via disguise and subterfuge and sort of more of a, of a spy situation more than like a rebellion situation. Bing. So you have what you might call um, coyotes essentially breaking through different barriers, getting very good at sneaking through the different borders to get goods, services, people. Um, across these borders. But just for good measure, just to really build out the world's detail, let's grab these three and say that um, because of this, different city-states have started to implement uh, genetic tailoring that adds keys and locks to people's DNA to make it easier to track them, easier to tell who belongs where, you know, mark um, different, different citizens as citizens of this country or that country via their DNA and that splicing and slicing of that DNA is often used to help people sneak through, to give people maybe universal keys or to remove their keys altogether. Bing. So you have this subclass of people who are unkeyed or rekeyed or multi-keyed. And there's sort of a, of a, you know, you can see how you could build off that later on to have kind of a legal aspect to that where, you know, maybe maybe being unkeyed is, is makes it more difficult to live in society. Maybe you use, you know, your genetic key to pay for things or something. Or maybe being rekeyed is illegal or maybe being multi-keyed is extremely illegal, you know, punishable with death or something. So you can see how we're starting to build it off. Previously, it could have been in any kind of setting. You know, this might have been medieval. This might have been, you know, modern day. It could have been futuristic, but now we're really getting down to it. It's now definitely a futuristic setting. 
And then these last two, you know, you don't have to use all of them. I'm just going to say we can't figure out anything with those and it's only two cards, so we'll just discard those and call it good. So now we have built one, two, three, four, five different world things that we would write down um, in the information about this world that we're doing. And then we'll build our mission and our specific situation and our characters around this world that we've created. And you can see how just in a few minutes you can create a brand new, pretty fully fleshed out world that you can start to experience with your characters. At any time during a game of a magic card, the role-playing game, you can create new situations or scenarios, missions, adventures for your characters to go on or come up with new parts of one when you don't necessarily know what should happen next by creating what we call situation things. And these are created very similarly to creating world things, except with world things you are coming up with overarching facts about the world that your characters are in. With situation things, they're much more specific to something that they're currently experiencing, something they might be trying to solve, something that might be sort of more temporary to the location that they're in or the time period, something along those lines. So what we start with is five cards of any of the sets, very similarly to how we created world things. Two, three, four, Five. And what we have here is we ended up with a bridge, uh, a coin, somebody kicking, a island of some sort, and a key. And the book officially says to use twice as many cards total as there are players, but I like to often go with five times as many when there are smaller groups of players. So let's just pretend that we have three players and let's draw 15 cards total again. Grab another things. Let's grab a second things. Why not? And on actions. And we'll just continue creating our first scene, our first situation for our characters to deal with um, in that same world that we created in the earlier video. So what you do is you can go around the table and at the beginning of an adventure you can have the characters, uh, the players work together to determine what kind of situation they're in or during a game that's already uh, occurring you can go on ahead and have the game master just take five of these or a set of these and, and use three at a time to create situation things to carry forward an adventure with. So let's just say right now that we're starting our first adventure with new characters uh, in the world that we created earlier. So each player would go around the table and choose up to three of these to determine one situation thing that is specific to what's happening to them right now. So we've obviously got a lot to work with, a lot of luck, key symbology that can go along with maybe our characters being sent on a coyote style mission where they're trying to get someone or something through one of these nation state borders. So let's just start with this lock um, and this person kicking. And why not? Let's add the airplane to it too. And we'll say that there is somebody who wants to get some cargo uh, through one of the borders in the nation state and the players have been asked to break through somehow. Bing. So that's pretty generic, pretty basic, kind of an, an overarching idea to go with. And now they, they can determine how they want to go about doing that or what their options are going to be. So let's say that there is an island chain with a set of bridges. Or rather, let's be a little bit more specific. Let's say that they are trying to get into a nation state that's on an island and that the only way through it is through a bridge or obviously through the oceans. Bing. So now we know, okay, the bridge is on lockdown. The island is where they're trying to get to. So we have a little bit more on the current situation. And let's go on ahead and use the two of these. And, you know, let's just stick with that for now because we might want to use some of these other ones for something else. So let's just say that this island nation is very wealthy and very militarily protected. Bing! So it's going to be a very difficult mission. This is a hard place to get into. They want people out and they want to keep them out. And let's go ahead and use the two of these. This is a, let's just say this is a pile of rocks. It's a pile of something. And this is somebody climbing, theoretically, or maybe swimming. Let's just say that there's some cliffs, that the, the island is extra high up. And to get up onto it, you'd have to scale these high, high cliffs if you were trying to approach from the ocean. Bing! So now we have a variety of different ways that the players can go about trying to accomplish this mission, um, but each one has its own individual challenges that we're starting to see here. And a lot of times you'll rely on turns of phrases, you'll be a little funny sometimes, so let's just use these pants, uh, this lock, and this key to say that um, they know somebody who can alter their jeans, pants, jeans, 
you know, your, your pants as in denim jeans and your genetic genes, you know, we're using kind of a turn of phrase there. Um, you know, it's not exactly funny, it's borderline funny. Um, and we'll just say that they know somebody or there are people around the place where they're currently coming from to go do this to this island nation who can alter their genes to give them uh, either a universal key or a genetic key specifically to the locks of this city. Bing. So maybe they could get through if they could get it together enough money to afford this service or they could do something for this type of person who does this service in order to be able to um, get that done to their genes so that they could get through rather easily in more of a stealthy way rather than necessarily having to break in or fight in or sail in and scale a wall or whatever. Um, these last three, we really can't think of anything with them, so let's just go on ahead and, and toss those aside. We don't really have to use all the cards very similar to how we made world things. So now we have one, two, three, four, and five situation things that build on our world things, that build on the world we've created, that build on each other, and that really set up this location that the characters are trying to go to. We don't know much about where they're coming from, so it might be up to the game master to figure that out, or maybe we've already figured that out before because maybe these characters are developing, maybe they've already been developed, maybe they're already existing in this setting that we've started, and now we're going to a new setting that is um, very well built out now. We have a lot to work with, a lot of different ways that the players can go about trying to accomplish their mission. And we can throw out there some reward. Uh, the book has some ideas for different rewards, different monetary systems that you can use inside of your game that you can use to entice your, your players into sending their characters on this mission. Creating characters in the Magikarp role-playing game actually follows a very similar process to creating situations and worlds. Uh, what we start off with is creating a character's core thing. Uh, which we start off by drawing five of any type of card. So we'll grab a world, a things, an actions, let's add another thing and maybe another world. And the important thing to remember about any character is that they are gauged to the world that they're in, which is to say that a good character fits in their world. So if you're working with maybe an office scenario or something, maybe a core thing might be an education that they got um, or, or a degree or some sort of specialized training they have. If you're working with a superhero world, it might automatically just be a power that they have. But any good thing or core thing that a character has will be related to the world that they're in. It will be somehow fitting inside of their world. And that's a very important part of the balance of creating characters and where the game master will often come in and telling uh, players that they can or can't do something or helping players to guide the development of their character. So the core thing is essentially the basis of your character. It's not equipment, uh, unless somehow that equipment relates to their history, like maybe it's your great-grandfather's sword that you've taken to war, or something along those lines. So it can be an object, and it can be even training or a power, if that directly relates to what is at the core of your character, what drives them, what, what is bringing them to the adventure that you're in, what's bringing them to the setting that you're in, and, and why they do what they do. For instance, um, you know, maybe maybe for a pirate it might be his ship. You know, that's an object that he owns, but it's also an object that that pushes his life forward. Or maybe for a gunslinger it would be their six shooter or their ability to to quick draw. And that might guide um, that might guide her entire life, what she does for a living, what she chooses to do with her time. So the core thing is essentially what is very, very important to the character. And you start by choosing up to three of the cards that you draw drew. But you can also uh, discard one and draw another one if you don't feel too strongly about one. So right off the top of my head, I'm not feeling too strongly about this sofa. So I'm going to replace that with a different one. That is a world, and I don't have to replace it with another world, but I am actually going to choose to replace it with another world card. So what we have now is we have a sign, we have somebody talking, something along those lines. We have a sky, maybe it's a sunset, maybe it's a sunrise, kind of a cloudy horizon with, with a sun. Um, we have a hatchet or an axe of some type, and a gun, pistol, six shooter. You can really interpret these however you need to in order to make your character work. So in this particular case, I think I'm actually going to make it a skill of sorts. Uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to take the gun, uh, this hatchet, and this street sign to say that this character grew up in a 
rough urban setting where it was sort of a, of, of, of a ghetto of sorts, where it's just a lot of people crammed together who don't really want to be together. It's a lot of desperation. It's a lot of difficulty. So he became a master, he or she. We haven't really decided gender yet of this character, but they became a master of a, a kind of close combat with firearms um, technique. I'll, re I'll name that later. Bing. Um, but, you know, we'll, we'll go with that for right now, just as we're beginning to develop this character. We don't exactly know their flair yet, but we do know that the setting is, is a little more modern, a little more technological, so being able to use firearms um, and, and close combat weaponry in an urban setting kind of makes sense as their, as their core. And this starts to give us some idea of the character. You know, it doesn't sound like it might be what drives them, but the more we think about it, the more we build out this idea and we end up with this concept of this character who is very much driven by their need to escape their situation. They live in this desperate situation and that's what drives them forward. Um, very much like you might see scoundrel type characters or roguish characters being driven by their, by their bad situations in life to constantly be looking for new opportunities. So his core thing does kind of um, kind of push that narrative forward, this idea of like what this character is. And we'll give it a name later, it's fine if you don't name it up front, but that'll be the core thing of this character, which is technically a skill, um, but it is also sort of, it also, you get into their background a little bit, you get into their personality, who they are, where they came from, and where they're trying to go to. And we probably won't give them a weapon, we'll see what their things end up with, but we do have a thing called general things in the game, which is basically, Anything that your character can reasonably be expected to have, they do have, based on their core things, their things, um, their group things, which we'll talk about a little bit later. But anything that you can expect them to have, they will have. So we just don't assign special abilities to those things. So for instance, right now we might say they definitely have a pistol, and they definitely have, I don't know, maybe a hatchet isn't all that appropriate. Let's say, well, why not? Let's say they do have a hatchet, or maybe a knife, really, whatever, whatever the player decides is the flair that they want to go with. So we'll just say up front that they have a ranged weapon, a firearm of some sort, one-handed, and a, and a one-handed uh, close range weapon of some sort. And, and that'll be their general things, but we just don't assign any special powers to those things. So it's just like a thing that they have so that they can use their core thing effectively. Uh, what we'll do next is we will develop a, their things. We'll start by just shuffling these cards back into their appropriate decks. That's a world, that was also a world. And we'll put this actions card back. And to develop things, every character starts off with two things. And these are much more direct objects that they can use. These are often pieces of equipment. These are maybe, um, you know, it might be a contact that they know. It might be some sort of education they, they received. It's much more of a smaller scale thing that they, that they received throughout their life. Um, so what we do for this is we draw five cards. I'll go with two things cards. I always like to build my things using things cards as much as possible. I'll add a world card to kind of gauge it to the world, and I'll add some actions because those can often make it easier to decide what exactly uh, the things do. And what we do first, we don't actually discard any cards on this. We'll build two things using these cards in a very special way. So we start by using up to three of these cards to build the first thing for the character. So it's a very easy one up front. Let's just use these I'm going to use these two for starters um, to say that they have this jumping, running ability, basically some sort of parkour. And since this is a modern setting, I'll just call it that. They know parkour. And in fact, let's add these fists here to say that they do some sort of fighting parkour, some sort of Jackie Chan-esque running around, jumping off things, using your environment to your advantage during combat. Bing! So that's kind of their specialization. That's why they specialize in, in the close combat plus the ranged combat, because they do this sort of combat environmental urban parkour ability. And we'll just call that something along those lines, maybe urban car parkour fighting style, something along those lines. And that'll be their first thing. And they'll use this, they can use this a lot along with their core thing to kind of, um, to kind of maximize the versatility of the core thing that we already developed. So what we do next to create the second thing is that we can take up to up to all three of these. You can take as many of the cards that you used to make your first thing and discard them and replace them. So I'm actually going to I'm going to keep the jumping guy because who knows what that's going to come to, and I'm going to replace these two cards. So I'll put that back, and I'll put that one back. And you can draw these from anything you you want. So since that's more of a technique, I'm going to go ahead and draw another thing 
and an additional world. Kind of try and push it a little bit more in the direction of, of an object as his final thing. And now using these cards, we choose again up to three, and we determine the character's second thing that they'll be going into play with. So there's a lot to potentially work with here, but I think I'm going to keep this one very simple. Now we know that this world is technological, we know that it's maybe on the verge of sci-fi, and we know that there is some sort of like DNA manipulation happening. So just to give this character a little bit more versatility within their world, I'm going to use these glasses, and I think I'll add the spear to say that they have some special glasses of some sort, some sort of technological glasses that allow them to, with incredible accuracy, examine someone's DNA. Bing. Essentially, maybe they used to be, um, maybe, maybe they knew or, or even stole from um, somebody who actually was on, on the police force finding people with DNA keys. So they, they have these, these glasses that they've learned how to use to examine people's DNA to find their keys that allow you into the different city-states. So we have our second thing. This one's actually an object. And, and now we can move forward with finishing to develop this character. But now this character has a core thing, uh, which is, you know, more or less very much tells us what their personality is, where they're coming from, where they're trying to go to. They have a technique that they can use that sort of works along with their core thing. And they have a completely unrelated object that they can use that is that is gauged within their world, but doesn't necessarily relate back to their core thing. And that's that's kind of the great thing about this game is that as you develop things, as you find things, and eventually as you develop precedences off your things, which is the primary way of characters developing over time, um, they don't always have to relate back to, to, to various bits and pieces of the character that you've already developed. They can branch off into new areas. They can be completely unrelated, but they always give your character more versatility and more options for how you can play them. So let's go ahead and put these back, and there is one more piece of characters that you develop after you've got their things and their core things, and that is their group thing. And the group thing is usually done after you've finished making all of the characters who are going to be playing together up front. And you can add more group things later, or, or as, you, as you change out characters for other characters. But a group thing is built very similar to the other ways, and a group thing tells you how characters are interacting with each other, why they're traveling together, why they're working together. And a lot of times a game master or the team themselves might come up with something, or if they can't think of anything, you can just draw some cards. So what you do with this, as usual, is you draw up to five cards. I'll do one of each of these, I'll throw in a second world, and I'll throw in one more world, because these often tend to be very situation-based. So we take up to three of these again, and we will develop a group thing, which is, it's, it's used very similarly in gameplay to how core things and things and precedences are using and that you use them to perform actions. But it is specifically related to how the characters interact with each other and why they're working together. So let's just keep this one very simple. Let's just say that all of these people are working together on this mission specifically for their own personal good. And we'll use this house and this flying person to say that they came from the same neighborhood. They all came from this very rough, run-down ghetto in this, in this very rough city, and they are seeking for something more like Icarus, essentially. They are trying to reach greater heights in their lives. Bing. Um, we could theoretically add in, add in the, um, the uh, throne here to say that they're reaching for extreme wealth or something, or we could add that in later. But for right now, I'm just going to use these two and say that that's the character's group thing. Let's just imagine that we've created a bunch of characters who are very similar to this one, who are all sort of these roguish characters with a miscellaneous collection of, of interesting um uh, abilities that, that generally relate back to this idea that they're all sort of more coming from a downtrodden situation than more of a, than more of a high class situation. So we'll just use those two and now we have a group thing for, uh, for this character and also for several of the other characters that would be together because the group things are, are created after you've created all the characters and then you decide how they interact with each other, how they relate to each other. Um, but alternatively, if you have characters that that maybe fit better as, as joining the group for other reasons, you can use other reasons. Maybe you have a posh character, someone who's very high class, or maybe you have um, 
some kind of a, of, a, of a police officer, somebody who actually their job is is was or is keeping people out of the city using these DNA keys. And they could be with the group for other reasons besides this. Maybe they didn't come from that same neighborhood. Maybe they're sympathetic to the neighborhood or maybe maybe they're down on their luck. Maybe the posh person is sort of a disgraced noble or something like that. You know, you can have you can have group things that relate to each other but aren't the same for different characters who are working together for reasons that are different but related to the reasons that other characters are working together. And group things is probably the most shifty, the most um, soft of, of the things in the game, the, the least concrete. Um, but it also often gives characters a really interesting way to interact with each other because group things actually allow characters to use actions together in tandem and to build precedences, which are a precedent is essentially the way that we add more functionality to, to a thing in the game. Um, to build those precedences together in, in ways that they can work together, in ways which they can use multiple actions simultaneously in a round to do really interesting things together. And group things are, are basically the only way in the game that you can do that. So now we have a completed character. And what you do after this is you take all this information that you've developed and you write the character paragraph which will describe the character, who they are, um, what they can do, and just give you a really basic script for how to play that character. Just give you some idea of, of who you are role-playing. And uh, next up at the end of this video, I'll just, I'll just narrate what the group or what the paragraph is for this character. And in the next video, we will show how to use all of these things in order to perform actions. Okay, so this is the character we created. This is Gretchen City. Uh, that's not a real last name. That's just kind of the last name in this world of anyone who doesn't actually have a family name because she was born and lives in a city. Uh, profession is street mercenary. And her species, or in this particular case, I guess ethnicity would be most appropriate, is uh, a Trongu keyed, which means that she is uh, genetically keyed to the Atrangu city. Uh, she has the usual three wounds, three setbacks, and three blunders of any starting character in the base edition of a match card. And then we'll get into her things. So, for starters, uh, we used World Card 64, uh, Things Card 2, and Things Card 41 to create uh, her core thing, which is sort of a skill, but also kind of uh, informs her character. She is an urban-born melee and firearms dual wielder. Growing up in the worst part of a Trangu, danger was a const near constant companion from your earliest of days. Survival dictated that you learn the way of the gun and the way of the blade, and as a dedicated survivor, you took to this education readily. A pistol in one hand and a knife in the other, few could match your ability at combat, and even fewer ever escaped a fight alive. Her first thing is parkour fighting style, which we made with card actions 10, actions 1, and world 13. Um, more than dual wielding, your fighting style incorporates your environment and your significant agility into a dance of destruction as effective as it is mesmerizing. And her second thing is a genetic loop. A loop, I'm not quite sure on that pronunciation, but it is uh, it, one of those jeweler's magnifiers tools. Uh, so we used uh, card things 25 and things 49 to make that. A simple device stolen from a police officer you once worked with. The small circle of glass embedded with scanners, microcircuitry, and a database containing a wealth of fully sequenced genomes allows you to examine any living be being's DNA. So we built up uh, her things there, gave each one an easy to refer to name, and this character is pretty much ready to play. Then we followed that up by creating the character paragraph, which is uh, a lot of information that just helps you play the character more readily. Um, these don't really play into any particular mechanic, but they do help with role-playing a lot. So, abandoned and ignored the southern outskirts where the river Ty Trigon bends around the great skyscrapers and carries the runoff from the lives of the wealthy into the streets of the poor was home to every possible violence. From the controlled hits of organized crime syndicates to the senseless attacks of those driven to the edge of sanity and beyond, to honor killings and blood feuds over nearly any perceived slight, to the feeble attempts of the police attempting to use cruelty as a means of law enforcement, to the kinds of predators that only nature can create. The streets were stained with hundreds of years of blood, and it was here that your life has been lived until now. At first you sought only to survive, to live to see another day as one of the city's thousands of forgotten orphans, but as time progressed and your skills in combat grew, so did your reputation. 
You've done jobs for everyone, from the Trangula and the Apon, the city's two largest organized crime families, to the police, to random businessmen looking for unscrupulous mercenaries to deal with their problems for them. They've all grown to respect you and to never ask more of you than you are willing to offer. You may not necessarily be at the top of your personal heap, but you're damn close, and few risk direct confrontation without a very good reason. So now we have a lot of information about the world we're building up, and the character paragraph can be a great place to do that, particularly in a brand new setting. Um, it's a great place to add flavor to your world that you can build off of later as you play. And that's the kind of fun thing about the Imagine Card role-playing game, is that almost any part of it can build up the world and can build up settings to make them more interesting as time goes by. So even, even a character's information can add a lot to the flavor of the world. Finally, we added this group thing, um, Seeker of a Better or Seeking a Better Life, which we built using card A53 and card W18. Um, riches, wealth, power, these remain beyond even your ability to imagine, but still you seek for a better life and a permanent escape from the streets you were born in and the cycle of violence that they've trapped you in your entire life. So this is basically what the character is looking for by being involved in the adventure. But furthermore, it's uh, what many of the characters are going to be looking for. Uh, several of the characters can use this exact same group thing or can build their own group things off of it, basically just explaining why they're working together. And then just for completion's sake, uh, to build off of her core thing, we gave Gretchen a general thing of a pistol and a general thing of a tactical knife. Just said, uh, continuity-wise, she has something to actually attack with. And the thing about general things is that you're often better off making them basic, making them kind of cruddy, so that the character has a reason to upgrade over time. So the th pistol, uh, a simple, half-rusted, half-dented, second-hand revolver. This thing has seriously seen better days. And the tactical knife, a basic knife from a military surplus store. It's both convenient and reliable for a variety of purposes. So we're already leaving it open a little bit for her to use it for more than just combat. Maybe she might cut a rope at some point or something. But general things can have precedences build off of them, which you can learn more about in the actual uh, role-playing game, but a precedent is essentially how we build off of things, how we make them more interesting and more usable and overall more unique. Um, but the, the thing you want to try and do as a game master is to limit the amount of precedences that a character can build off of a general thing, just because general things are kind of there, but they're not meant to be special. Um, eventually, ideally, Gretchen would get a better pistol, would get a better knife, that she could use to upgrade with precedences and make it increasingly more interesting. Uh, she doesn't currently have any precedences on her character sheet, but we did give her some wealth. Um, we gave her 1d6 worth of work days in Atrangu credits, which work days are a method of calculating wealth in the game that we use just to, just to figure out uh, generally speaking, what a day of basic physical labor is worth in a world, and then extrapolate out the costs of everything else from there. So a trunk of credits, let's just say, maybe it's 100 credits per day for, for basic labor. That's maybe the minimum wage. So in this case, you'd roll a d6 at the beginning of play and just see how many credits she started with. Maybe you'd roll a 4 and she'd get 400 Atrangu credits to spend as you play along, which is pretty reasonable for um, a general mercenary in this world uh, because she, she'd kind of have an amount of money saved up, but she's probably living pretty close to the edge. And that's the character in a nutshell and the character sheet in a nutshell. And from there, you can start playing this character right away. And you can actually find this character and uh, information on the setting and the situation that we built in these videos on our website, creepyassassingames.com. Uh, you can find downloads for all of these samples that we've done in addition to several more uh, sample characters that you can play directly in this adventure if you want to. So taking actions in the Imagine Card role-playing game is actually significantly different from a lot of other, the other stuff we've done so far, but it is um, a lot more interesting because it's a lot more active. So what we'll do to take an action is you always start by drawing one action card, and then you draw up to two of any of the other cards. So let's go ahead and draw a world, and I'll draw another action card um, just because I like to have a variety of actions available. Uh, of, of, you know, symbols for different actions that I might try out. I feel like it kind of gives you an option a lot of the times to negotiate, to 
break through something or what have you. And let's just say for an example that the action we're taking right now is to try and get through a checkpoint at this city state that this character that we made earlier is trying to get through. So to take an action, you uh, decide which of the character's things, uh, their core thing, their group thing, general things, or any of their precedences you're going to use in order to try and do something to get your characters closer to succeeding at their current task. Um, and you basically use each one of the cards, or as many of the cards as you can, to describe this action. And if you can't think of any, that's fine. You can always just run with one of your things, or core thing, or precedent, or whatever, to, um, to just try and perform the action as simply as you can. Because we're going to be rolling dice for this, and if you can't think of anything just for taking the action, you roll one die. And then you add one die per additional uh, card that you can actually use on your action. Now, part of actions is that a lot of times they'll use turns of phrases or just sort of sort of use language to get fit the cards in, and that's totally fine. Creativity is completely rewarded in a magic card. So let's just say uh, we're going to try and use our parkour, and let's just say that they're going to try and catch a lucky break. In fact, we could even say they can try and catch a break, but I'm not actually going to use that one for that. We'll say that they'll try and catch a lucky break and find an opening in the barricade, in, in the military barricade, to break through and sort of do some kind of leaping stuff. Essentially try and, try and, try and leap through without anybody really noticing, do some kind of really, really slidey, really grease man kind of stuff, you know, like you might see in, in old school um, uh, heist movies, like, like the old Ocean's Eleven type style movies where you always have one character who just like does this really slidey stuff, really, you know, very much like parkour style stuff to just get through things. And usually that character then ends up on their own for a while, but at least they've made it through and they can do things on the other side of whatever the other characters are trying to get through in order to help the other characters get through after the fact. You know, maybe once this character's through, they can try and open up the barricade or, or sabotage something or whatever. But that's what this character is going to do. So we were actually able to use all three of them. And that's relatively clever. It's not too much of a stretch on language. So as the game master, I would let that fly. So what we do now is we roll all of the dice that we have available for this action. And we look for fives and sixes. One of them got away, so let's try that one again. Anything that ends up on the floor gets re-rolled. Okay, and that was kind of lucky because we don't know what that one would have come up with, but that is our only five. So technically, this action succeeded. All you need is one of the dice to hit a five or a six to, for the action to be considered a success. And each additional dice that rolls a five or a six from there is considered an additional success with the game master giving out different bonuses or maybe making it easier to get through uh, the situation at hand the more uh, successes you rolled. So at the very least, they got a five. So we'll just say that this character managed to managed to watch the patrols a little bit as as they're waiting in line to be checked to be checked through to have their DNA keys checked to get into the city state they're trying to get into. And let's just say that the character kind of does when they see an opening, they just they they seize on it and they just run and they do this fl sort of flying leap thing where they just slide right behind the commander and all of the other officers aren't aren't currently looking and they just get right through and they do a roll on the other side of the barricade and they hide behind something. So it's not an amazing success. They might get caught, something might go wrong still, but they are through and that's what they were trying to do. If they got more successes, we might say that they managed to roll away into some place where, where they can really hide. You know, right now they're just like maybe behind a little piece of plywood or something. They're barely hidden. Um, but if they got more successes, we might say that they got all the way through. You know, maybe they, maybe they just managed to make a flying leap for it and they just kept running and nobody noticed. And now they're, you know, halfway across the bridge into the city state or something. Um, but di different levels of success can give different, different levels of of success of the action to the character from the game master. Um, but one is always enough to succeed. So at the very least, this character has succeeded at what they were attempting to do in this exact moment, not much more than that. But the next round, or perhaps when the other characters start taking their actions, they might get more opportunities to become more and more successful at getting through this situation. And eventually, the characters will have enough successes in order to completely get through the current situation and move on to whatever the next obstacle is.